Welcome to the LSU Sports Insider Podcast. Today is Tuesday, August the 27th. I'm Zach Ewing, along with Scott Rabelais and Wilson Alexander, who swear to me they did not actually plan to coordinate outfits. No, we did not. Okay. Um, I'm calling it the LSU gender reveal party. <laughs> Apparently we're having a girl. Um, but... They, they claim it wasn't intentional. For anybody who is maybe listening to this podcast, we are both wearing <laughs> light pink sh- polo shirts of different brands, but still like the same undertones the same and this exact yeah. same like color khaki pants. Same shade of khaki pants. Yeah. We I mean, walked I, into the building this morning and we just we looked at each other and just started <laughs> bursting out laughing. I was immediately reminded of, of a joke from Frazier where, where Frazier and Niles walked into the coffee shop dressed the same and, and Niles said, why, why don't you just steal my strong chin and swimmer's build? Of course, <laughs> Wilson's the one with the strong chin and swimmer's build, but <laughs> so you know, you anyway. Him to say, yeah. Okay. Well, on that note, we're glad you're here and uh, we can... We can <laughs> We can uh, promise plenty more hijinks over the next uh, 30, 45 minutes or so. Uh, we're we're going to kind of preview USC LSU in two parts this week, okay? So Thursday, we're really going to break down the game. That's going to be with Koki Riley Reed and Reed Darcy um, because these guys are, are headed to Vegas for, for the game on Sunday. Um, so we'll do that, and it, we'll, we'll kind of break down, you know, offense versus defense on each side, special teams, keys to the game, all of that sort of stuff. Today maybe a more holistic approach guys we'll talk about some of the storylines going into this game what it means for lsu and and what it means for usc because i think you know we we're looking at this obviously from from the lsu side but it's a big game for usc too um and so we're going to break down all of that a couple of housekeeping notes for you want to let you know uh that the lsu sports insider is brought to you by waste pro tiger fans if you're planning a tailgate or event keep your guests comfortable with portable toilets from waste pro Call 225-744-6400 and mention the LSU Sports Insider for a special offer. We're also brought to you by the Baton Rouge Clinic, your trusted healthcare provider in the heart of Baton Rouge. Whether you're in need of primary care, specialist services, or urgent care, the Baton Rouge Clinic has you covered with a team of dedicated and experienced professionals. Visit batonrougeclinic.com to learn more or to schedule your appointment today. The Baton Rouge Clinic, caring for generations. And on that note, we got a quick break we got to take. Uh, Another word from our sponsors, and we're going to start breaking down USC LSU right after this. You know how far I've gone, now I'm home again. I'm feeling more alive these days than I've ever been. At the Baton Rouge Clinic, our sole focus is to provide exceptional health care for your entire family so that you can get back to doing what you love most. We are caring for generations. Football fans, with the Caesars Sportsbook app, you can be in the game all the time. Seeking instant action? Quick Picks offers you the most popular games and markets already built for you and ready to bet. Experience the thrill when you stack your bets to create a super parlay. Build bets for your favorite teams and players across multiple games. This season, don't just watch the game. Download Caesars Sportsbook and experience the game like never before. And welcome back to the LSU Sports Insider Podcast for Tuesday, August the 27th, previewing USC LSU with LSU football beat writer Wilson Alexander and our lead columnist Scott Rabelais. I don't, did I introduce y'all before or just your shirts? I, I, <laughs> I think you were so taken aback by our, our, our sartorial splendor uh, that, that oh, you forgot, that to, forgot to mention us. Thank you. You, yeah. Yeah, you, nice. you. you do look good. It's just funny that you dress the exact same way. Incredible. So, um, okay, look, LSU versus USC, we're finally to game week. Um, I, I know. Look, we're supposed to be the button-down media and, and be um, down the middle on everything. We get excited for game week too. Like oh it's, yeah, it's finally here. I know. I've been. I mean, especially. So I, I only cover LSU football. So like the off season hits, and you know it's nice. I get to work on my golf game a lot more than Rab does in the spring. But uh, even though I'm still not nearly as good as he is, but uh, <laughs> it makes me have to wait for like eight months. You know, for a game, and so it's, it feels great that game weeks here. Watching Georgia Tech, Florida State was awesome. College football is back, and it just bring on all the chaos because it, it's really exciting this year with the twelve team playoff, the expanded SEC. There's so much to like, especially in our for us to just like chew on and chat about. Yeah, uh, there, there's only what like twelve to sixteen of these things, and the entire year, the entire college football universe is focused on those twelve to sixteen. Like they're a big deal, and so we get the first one of them um, this Sunday. 
Game's at 6.30 p.m. Central Time. It's in Allegiant Stadium in Las Vegas, the home of the uh, Las Vegas Raiders. And, uh, like, it's it's a big game for both teams, and we'll get to that. I did want to start, actually, with the injury report. Today's injury report is brought to you by the Baton Rouge Clinic. And this is good news for LSU, Wilson. They've only really got one guy who's even questionable, and that's wide receiver Chris Hilton. That's right. Chris has a bone bruise, Brian Kelly said. Um he was supposed to yesterday move around with athletic trainers. We'll be able to get an update, excuse me, from Brian Kelly on Wednesday morning about his status for the game. If Chris, who really was supposed to be going into this season for the first time as a starter in his career, if he's not able to go, then redshirt freshman Kyle Parker is in line to start. Uh, Kyle did not play much as a freshman, um, but this would get, so this would be his first career start. And he had a, a nice end to preseason camp. Uh, in particular, when Chris had to miss practice last Saturday, and he would be the one who would be next up in line to play. You'd also see some other guys in the rotation, like Xavion Thomas, potentially Aaron Anderson, I think in particular. Um, but your you're starting three would be Kyron Lacey, C.J. Daniels, and Kyle Parker in that scenario. Um, the other one to note is just Miles Frazier, uh, but he's probable for this game and would you know was expected to, to practice today and, and not someone who I think at this stage you would be worried about missing the game. Yeah, They're, they don't call people probable in this day and age unless they're pretty confident, barring a setback, that he's, yeah, he's going to play. Yeah, exactly. Uh, Rab, I, I know LSU lost Brian Thomas and Malik Neighbors. I I don't have a lot of concern about them finding more receivers. <laughs> like it just it seems like this is everybody says it's DBU. It's it's WRU now. Yeah, that, that's kind of true. Uh, it, the the depth of the receiving core. To, to to as Wilson made the point, you just you know, elevate a uh, Kyle Parker, is is maybe you you could make the argument is better than it was last year. Uh, they, they've got a lot of guys who are waiting to get their hands on the football, and it'll be interesting to see are they in three wide personnel as much this year because they have they have tight ends to they to go to. Uh, you know, I know Koki, our Koki Riley wrote a story speculating they're gonna be a lot of more twelve personnel with a, with a couple of tight ends, and, and and so that'll be interesting to see in this first game especially if chris thomas can't play but yeah there, there are there are a lot of hands to to put on the football and to get the ball in the in the hands of you know cj daniels has come and and i'm blanking on the other with the Xavier other Xavier thomas, Xavier thomas uh, yeah so yeah and aaron anderson we didn't see much of him last year is he going to have a breakout year um it won't be easy i mean if you if you if you get if you get double digit catches in this in this offense with all these receivers, you've probably played pretty well. So that that's going to be an interesting thing to see, especially in this first game, if they don't have a, a, a Thomas to play, who I think, uh, a Chris Hilton to play, who I think is, to me, maybe poised to be the Brian Thomas of, of this uh, of this receiving core. This Certainly year. a different skill set. Chris Hilton is much more of like a, he's smaller. Mm -hmm. uh, you think of him more as like a traditional slot, even though wide receivers sort of play every position nowadays. Like yeah. I think you'll see a lot of C.J. Daniels and Kyron Lacey in the slot this year. Chris, you know, his kind of calling card has been his speed downfield. I mean, he's probably the fastest. He has an argument to be the fastest player on the entire team. Um, and he – so different – even though Brian Thomas is a really good vertical threat, um, you know, he's 6'4". Chris Hilton's yeah. like around six foot, uh, somewhere like that. Uh, six one, maybe six two, somewhere. But certainly not Brian Thomas's height. So different kind of style player, but someone who, even though he's mostly been a vertical guy when, when healthy in his career, uh, LSU coaches think that he's really improved his entire route tree, which we've seen glimpses of this preseason. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, the one knock on Hilton has been that he's been injury prone mm -hmm. throughout his career, and so hopefully he can go on Sunday. It sounds like it's healing and they just want to make sure it's there so uh, we'll update that on thursday with whatever we can in the baton rouge clinic injury report that day um the guy thrown to all these receivers and who, who gets to benefit from this embarrassment of riches even without neighbors and thomas is, is garrett nussmeyer and, and i bring him up uh partly because wilson wrote a terrific feature story you should go read it the advocate.com slash lsu um kind of about his journey but also because he he's our our star player and it's it's weird because i haven't played a game yet but we're going to say today's star player segment is proudly sponsored by waste pro ensure your tailgate or event is a hit with clean and convenient portable toilets from waste pro rent yours today um and, and i you know star player spotlight player i don't know how you want to put this wilson he sure it, but Point blank, LSU needs Nussmeyer to step in and be and be good if they, if they're going to be good this year. Yeah, yeah, you're replacing a Heisman winner now for just the second time in LSU history, and everybody will remember the last time that happened. Miles Brennan came in, um, almost a somewhat similar sort of 
career arc as Garrett in terms of like waiting for a long time to get his shot. And he was playing all right there. 2020 season was all weird, obviously. And then he gets hurt at Missouri. Um, but you know, so here comes in Garrett Nussmeyer, a guy who, you know, he was the first quarterback to commit after like Joe Burrow and the national championship and all of that happened. Hmm. Um, he was a top 100 recruit. Um, and it was kind of this moment of, oh, hey, LSU's quarterback recruiting is really improving as a result of this offensive transformation. And so he's been waiting now for three years and finally gets his chance to go out there and really show what he can do. He got his first start, of course, in the ReliQuest Bowl, played well, uh, led that 98-yard game-winning drive. Um, but this is going to be different. You know, teams are going to have, uh, you know, there's going to be a full game of tape for USC to look at with him. And it's also just a very different scenario playing in a, an exhibition game, you know, bowl game versus games that actually really matter, have a little bit more stakes to them. You're not just playing Wisconsin in a game going into the offseason. Like uh, this is USC in Las Vegas. Uh, there's a lot on him right now. Um, but he is someone who LSU's coaches can make it think he can make any throw. Uh, he's just got to be smart with the football. That's always been the thing with Garrett, and we're going to really see it for the first time in extended action here uh, if his decision-making has improved from where it was at the beginning of his career. That, that was a great uh, – I, I thought it was a great analogy Brian Kelly made saying that uh, last week he said, uh, you know, it, it wasn't his car, you know, before. When he'd come into the game and they're either behind and they need him to do something or it's mop-up time and they just wanted to, you know, keep Jaden healthy. And now, But now it's his car and he doesn't want to, you know, ding the car. So he's maybe not going to take his many chances that'll be, that'll be interesting to see to me because when when Jaden's got the start against Florida State two years ago in the Superdome and you know things didn't look right in the passing game he'd take off running mm -hmm. well you know Garrett as we've said many times is mobile he, he can move around he's not a statue in the pocket like Zach Mettenberger was 10 years ago but he's not going to take off and want to run for 30 or 40 yards so it, it's going to be checking down to another to the receiver uh, to a third receiver or fourth receiver or throwing the ball away and then of course that puts more pressure on you maybe and maybe sets up a third and long situation or something like that so that's going to be interesting to see what what he does when uh, when the pressure's on and he doesn't want to make a mistake doesn't want to force it i do think he's still going to take a, little, a few more chances oh, for sure than than jaden did it's in his the dna game. i mean yeah, yeah jaden was so so good at protecting the football through four interceptions last year yeah a Garrett is probably, I would say, if th Garrett throws less than 10 picks this year, I'm pretty happy. If it's like eight, less than one per game, right? Yeah. yeah. If it's like eight or six somewhere in that r more range, which no. I think was kind of where a lot of SEC quarterbacks fell last year. Yeah. That'd, that'd like that would be season. pretty fine. Especially with how aggressive he is, right? Yeah. I mean, um, we saw him two years ago in the SEC championship game come in, I guess, late first half. Is that right? In the second half. It was yeah. at halftime. Um, and, and they were down big to Georgia. And he just, I mean, you talk about a gunslinger. Like, he just let it loose, and he threw for 300 yards in the second half of that game. He comes into this thing as, like, one of the more hyped backups I can remember just because he's had these games and these moments, um, you know, that shows what he can do. But but you're right. It's different when the spotlight is on you, and that, that's kind of why we're writing about him and talking about him. Yeah, uh, uh, sorry. Oh, I was going to say, well, you Nick, no. Nick Saban, you, you talk about him being a hyped backup that you can remember. Like Nick Saban is, you know, throughout this offseason uh, has been calling him like his like a sleeper quarterback in, in the country. You've got you're hearing that from Nick Saban's mouth. You know, he, he thinks highly of, of Garrett. Uh, clearly, he keeps expressing quite a lot of belief in him now in his role as an analyst uh, on TV. Um, but, you know, that's uh, that's a nice endorsement to come from someone like Nick Saban. Well, I was going to say what occurred to me way back in the day. I'm going to make an old reference. Roger Staubach with the Dallas Cowboys had a backup quarterback named Clint Longley, and they called him the Mad Bomber. Like, he'd come in and just throw the ball around when he had to, throwing the ball around. That was kind of Garrett's role, and it's it's different. You, you've got to be more responsible, for lack of a better word, when you're the starting quarterback. It's a, it's a different role. And, uh, and, and, and this is kind of unusual to see someone, you know, in this day and age, wait for their turn to be yes. the quarterback. Uh, I, I also made a, an older reference. Matt Flynn waited his turn in 2007 to be the starting quarterback after Jamarcus Russell left to go to the Raiders, right, as their number one draft pick. Uh, the, and the, and it, what, what resulted was a national championship season for LSU. And uh, can can he be that? Can can he be that guy that the Matt Flynn to lead them to a national championship or 
at least the college football playoff. That's the first goal, obviously, is to get in the, one of those 12 team spots. It's going to be fascinating to watch. You know, he, he's a coach's son. He's been around football his whole life, you know, thinking and breathing and growing up in football. You know, and, you know, I, I, how many other sports did he play, Wilson? Yeah, he played ba- baseball, and okay. I think he played a little basketball too. Um, there's this cute picture his mom shared of him playing t-ball in Lake Charles when he was four. Um, you know, but football was always the thing. He was throwing a football. Yeah. yeah, he was. His parents, you know, really emphasized they never tried to push him toward that. But it was what he he never wanted to do anything else. He was sleeping with a football. Um, his dad <laughs> and him were playing knee football in the living room and throwing in the backyard. Gary and Garrett was just asking him constantly, like, "Let's go throw. Let's go throw." That it was always the thing that he wanted to do. And, and now he gets his chance. And I, I brought up the 22 SEC championship game in part, Rab, because you had a, kind of an interesting thought yesterday about, and, and this is the title of this podcast, maybe it's an underrated, underrated reason to be optimistic about LSU this year. They've got 18 guys who got, saw action, saw the field in, in Mercedes-Benz Stadium that day in Atlanta. Um, that's more than I would have thought. And, and it goes to show you, this is yes, they lost Jaden Daniels. Yes, they lost... Malik Neighbors, Brian Thomas, um, obviously key pieces. But this is a pretty experienced team, and I'm not sure nationally or maybe even locally LSU gets enough credit for that. No, that surprised me a little bit too. I was looking for photos to go with something – and I was like, hmm, yeah, uh, with a story referencing, oh, that was like the, the SEC uh, uh, tiebreaker format finally came out last week for the uh, for the SEC championship game because there's no divisions this year. It's just this is one through sixteen, and you got to have you, you know, know. We'll get to that when we have to. <laughs> yeah, I, I, don't, I don't want to get into. I don't want to get into that. But I was looking for a photo from the uh, the championship game. It's like, oh, well, that guy, uh, he's still on the team, and he's still on the team, and he's still. On so, I, so I decided to look it up, and I looked at the participation chart. And Eighteen guys, eight starters. Uh, John, if I can run through them real quickly, John Emery, Emery Jones, Will Campbell, Miles Frazier, uh, uh, Mason Taylor, Major Burns, Greg Penn, and Harold Perkins. And then uh, Nussmeyer played in the game, Sage Ryan, uh, Kyron Lacey, Josh Williams, uh, Savion Jones, uh, Dellinger, uh, uh, Jacoby and Guillory. So a lot of guys have played not only you know back from last year and, and we focused the point is we focused a lot on what they lost last year you lose the heisman trophy winner and two other first round draft pick wide receivers in Jaden daniels malik neighbors and brian thomas and obviously you focus on what they lost and rightly so but but there's a lot of experience back and that counts for i, I think we don't really think about that as much but it counts for a lot in college athletics because an old uh, a team with a lot of older veterans um, who've been through the wars, who've been in the close games, counts for a lot, and and maybe in in, in some ways supplants talent. I think we think to focus on the talent, but it, but it's uh, it's something that it, that LSU has on their side, and even the the bad experiences, even the the season opening losses to Florida State the last two years, th- they can learn from those mistakes and what they didn't do well in those games, and, and it could benefit them against USC and in the other big games they have on the schedule. To that point. We spoke with Will Campbell, the guy who start he's a true freshman, has started since that 2022 season, started those season openers, that, that championship game like you mentioned. We spoke with him at the beginning of preseason camp, and in the subject of LSU having not won an opener in his career, but also since the 2019 season came up, Will said in no certain words, that is not going to happen again. He didn't, like, guarantee a win. I mean, I don't think you want to do that in the beginning of August. But the, the, the mindset of this team is they do not – want to come out of the season opener once again with a loss. Um, and that's coming from your number seven, your left tackle, who's been there in every single game pretty much for and the last two years. And didn't you think they, they kind of thought they were going to handle Florida State last year? Well, no, no, because, I mean, gosh, I, I, that I, I game didn't, was, I didn't think they came with enough really intensity good. last year. You can, you can disagree. I, I didn't think, oh, you, you say that you thought LSU yeah, thought it was going to yeah. handle Florida State. No, I just, I just felt like they came in, um, they were just still sloppy coming out of the preseason mm-hmm. for the second year in a row. It just wasn't crisp. And Florida State was already kind of firing on all cylinders. Um, why that happened, uh, I'm not totally sure, but it's something that has kind of happened now for two years in well, a row. Well, they played a game at the Florida State. They had, gosh, now you're getting me. No. I can't remember what's happening. <laughs> One of those games they played a game before. USC is, has not, so they're both starting fresh. Yeah, th- this, is, uh, this is a good transition into what we want to talk about next, but I, d- I did want to mention, like, okay, we're talking about the 2022 SEC Championship, Rab, and it's only two years ago. And maybe 30 years ago in college football, um, it wouldn't have been – that's surprising to say, yeah, we had eight starters playing in the SEC championship game two years ago. In this day and age, that's a big advantage. I mean, that's continuity that a lot of teams do not have. 
It, it is, but it's also something that it makes me think about the defense because a lot of players are back from last year's defense. Maybe not. I, I can't remember who you have written down in terms of who started for LSU in the 22 championship game on defense, but LSU has a lot of the same players coming back. Is that a good thing on defense? <laughs> we don't know. The thing is, like, uh, they've changed coaching staffs on the defensive side, but it's a lot of the same players from last year. And LSU is going to have to get a lot more out of the coaching staff. You Usually, in college football like these days, like you said, if you have an experienced team that's been around each other for a long time, it's great because everybody transfers so much nowadays. But should have LSU brought in some more transfers on the defensive side? That's the thing that we're going to kind of, I think, be talking about and finding out throughout the season. Yeah, and that brings us to Sunday and, and to USC, LSU. And, and the question we pose here is, Again, looking at this holistically, and we're, we'll really drill down into more of the matchups and things on Thursday, but it, it this is a, a high-pressure game for LSU and for USC, I think. And, and even in the 12-team playoff era, if you come away with a loss Sunday night, okay, you, you're not out of it, but your margin for error is pretty much gone. Um, you can maybe lose one more game along the way, but you look at these team schedules, and it's like it's pretty hard to say you're only going to lose one more. So somebody... It is going to be, um, you know, backed into a corner after Sunday night. And you mentioned what Will Campbell said, LSU does not want that team to be them for the third straight year. And, and I think it goes to the coaching staffs too, Rab. You, you have Brian Kelly, who was brought in here in no uncertain terms to win and win big. And Lincoln Riley, same thing at USC. He was not brought in there to go 9-3. and three. He was brought in there to make playoffs and win national championships. And one of those teams is going to be on that path Sunday night and the, and the other won't. Yeah, very similar. Really, obviously, Lincoln Riley is a lot younger than, than Brian Kelly, but uh, similar in that they both left, high, you know, uh, established power programs to go to their new schools. Yeah, Riley leaving Oklahoma, of course, and and uh, and at the same time. And we thought back then that Lincoln Riley was a likely guy to take the LSU job. And remember, we, we Leah Van, our former colleague, went to the Bedlam game with the Oklahoma Oklahoma State yeah. game and went to Lincoln Riley's press conference after the game. He's like, I'm not going to LSU you didn't ask me about USC ha <laughs> ha bye and so uh and, and then Brian Kelly of course left uh left L, uh left Notre Dame for LSU Wilson do you remember me holding up I was notebook? about to ask you to recount this story <laughs> so this th that Saturday it was it was wild go ahead yeah so this is LSU's uh last home home game and they're uh so, so I heard from from a source that at halftime the board of supervisors members were talking about Brian Kelly. So I wrote his name on a, on a notebook just like this. And after the game, I held up to Wilson and said, "I'm going to show you a name." And he goes, "Oh my God!" <laughs> because Brian Kelly's going to leave Notre Dame for LSU. I mean, it seemed impossible. It still seemed outlandish uh, until, you know, what happened to recount that period was. You know, this is Thanksgiving weekend, like I said, into the regular season. Uh, Lincoln Riley gets hired at USC like the next day yeah. um and then that monday i think is when kelly got hired away from notre dame like it was like that's the thing like, these two have been tied together since that weekend strange, because it was like back-to-back yeah, -back days ways, where yes. they both left for these major jobs for other major jobs and where everybody thought like you said lincoln riley was going um to uh lsu that there was so much chatter about it so many people in baton rouge thought that he was like people who usually know things like thought like oh man they're talking to lincoln riley and it was just a smoke a, ma a massive smoke screen and um which is you know <laughs> some of the the chaos of college football that, uh, and all that but it uh th it just sort of set them up on this path though so it's so fun that they're you know playing it together uh, telling each other a few years later because um they really have been connected since that weekend but back to your original question who's under more pressure that's right that's right yes. yes, we got off on a tangent but it was fun to talk about because it was such a no, interesting no, no, it's, episode it's, it's very good context <laughs> but um i i would say there's a little more pressure on lincoln riley because they just had like this utter collapse of the end of the last season right i mean they, they finished very poorly and the, the you know their defense was bad he had to change defensive coordinators and again a lot of similarities but i would say uh, a little more on, on on him uh lsu has shown an ability from the last two years to rally from a season opening loss and and obviously they still won the sec west two years ago and and they were still a 10-win team last year it's very important for both but i would think there's a little more pressure on riley because because um, he's still got to show, I think he's still got to prove that he can win like they want him to win at USC. And, and Kelly's done that a little more. But it's 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 big for both. And, 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 the, and the winner is, is set up in great shape. 
and the loser is like facing a really tough conference schedule, either the SEC or the Big Ten, and you're like, man, this is a, a, you know not hardly any margin of error. Maybe you can lose one more game and, and still consider yourself a playoff contender. So I would I would think USC and Lincoln Riley uh, face a little more pressure in this game. I th- I agree that they face a little bit more because Brian Kelly, LSU under Brian Kelly has accomplished a little bit more over the last two years. You know, you won the SEC West in year one and went to the conference title game. You had the Heisman winner in year two. Over the last two years, you got back-to-back 10-win seasons, and overall you're 20-7. and But the knock, which has been a knock on Brian Kelly throughout his career, is that LSU has come out pretty flat in a lot of big games. You think back to Tennessee, in 2021, here in, you know, in Tiger Stadium, getting 22. blown out. Um, you think about last year, the games that they lost, they really lost to Florida State, to Alabama, uh, in particular. Um, and the third loss, Ole Texas Miss was a, you know, was a barn burner um, there. But you know, they, they lost. Um, you know, in, in, in games that they just weren't competitive in some, against some of the be- best teams. They weren't competitive against Georgia in the 2022 SEC Championship game. And Texas A&M really kind of a downer the week before that, too. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. Yeah. You know, they went into that as a potential, like, fringe playoff team, even though it seemed sort of outlandish, and then laid a complete egg. And they need to come out in a big game and, I think, kind of control it. Like, I don't know, I don't know that they will, but they need, to, they need to win and they need to look good like look efficient and clean doing it um, to kind of give everybody a good boost. At the end of the day, just win the game. But if they can look good while they're doing it as well, I think that'll set LSU up perception-wise much better going into the year. So they'll say, like, okay, there's all this talk about year three and Brian Kelly, what he's done in the past. That was when Notre Dame went to the national championship game. Uh, I'm not expecting LSU to go to the national championship game this year, but he has said himself throughout the offseason, like, you know, year three is usually when his pro- he gets, starts to get the most out of his programs. He's set those expectations himself, and they need to go and actually meet them in this game. So while Lincoln Riley, I think, just hasn't accomplished as much at USC yet, so he really needs this a little bit more than maybe Brian Kelly does. Kelly's probably bought himself a little bit more um, leeway, I guess would be the word. There's still a lot on Kelly in this going into this game. They they need to win it. I, I really think it, our colleague Reed Darcy will probably bring this up on Thursday, but we had a roundtable where we all sort of just shared our thoughts on what is the most important thing that LSU needs in order to win, get to the college football playoff. He, he thinks it's winning against USC. I would say a huge game. Do you, and, and it's it's funny the similarities between Riley and Kelly that you guys are talking about. Even both programs are trying to replace Heisman Trophy winners at quarterback, by the way. Caleb mm-hmm. Williams, two years ago, but he played last year for USC. As you mentioned, kind of they fell off the map. I, I agree with you guys. I think Lincoln Riley's probably have more pressure, but that certainly could change by 10 o'clock Sunday night. I mean, whoever loses this game, that that's the guy who has more pressure on him at that point. Um, so you want to know what these guys think will happen Sunday night? Well, you got to wait to the end of the show. A couple other things we're going to talk about first. We had actual college football on Saturday. And, and uh, I, I just want to touch real briefly on the Florida State-Georgia Tech game, which was obviously the game of the day. Florida State was like a 10-point favorite. They get upset. I, I, and it was a close game. It came down to a field goal. I actually thought Georgia Tech controlled that game they for did. the most part. Wow. Um, I think Bill Connolly, who does ESPN's SP Plus, has like post-game win expectancy, said Georgia Tech was like 97% to win that game based on the stats. I mean, they, they really controlled that game. Um what lessons can LSU take from that? I, I think one of them is obviously you got to take everybody seriously, and it's not that they weren't going to take USC seriously. But I'm talking about who, who's the Georgia Tech on LSU schedules at South Carolina, or you, you know, one, one of these teams you, you kind of pencil in as a win, but hey, you, you better take it seriously. And then number two, Rab, you brought this up. It, it, it's also just it, it's kind of a window into this new era of college football where. We now have to take Georgia Tech, at least for the time being, as a college football playoff contender. Yeah, I, I, to me, that's that's the biggest takeaway from this game is that immediately, right out of the right out of the gate of this new uh, twelve team college football playoff era, you have teams that that you and Georgia Tech is is the the the, the standard bearer for the moment that you know you didn't even really consider before the season started, and now you have to say, well, wait a minute, and and uh, I think a lot of other fan bases and teams have to say, well, well, our team can put... Can, now the question is, can Georgia Tech put together like a 10-2 and two season and get in the college football playoff? And I think a lot of other fan bases and teams are out there going, well, wait a minute, my team can can put together a, a 10 win season and, and and be in the playoff. Uh, you know, it's it's possible. I, I think you, you, you've gone from, you know, maybe you thought, you know, 20 teams could do it to, to you know, 30 or more teams can do it. So I think, I think it's... Uh, 
we all expected that with, with the playoff. Obviously, we're going to go into November, and the teams will get whittled down. And I, I wrote predicting all the LSU scores uh, column last week, saying I think the LSU-Alabama game could end up at that point in the season being a pre-playoff playoff game, where it's like the loser is maybe knocked out of contention and, and the winner you know, is still in contention for one of those spots. But I think for the moment, it's really opened up a lot of people saying, given a lot of people hope, and not just people who follow Georgia Tech, but, but given a lot of people hope to think that, uh, my team in in the recent past has 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 done, uh, yeah, let's say Texas A and M for example, a team that was in 2020 was was just outside the, the four team college football playoff, right? Mm -hmm. They went nine and one that year. Uh, Texas A and M fans could go, well, well, we could have a season like that again and, and be in the college football playoff, and and maybe before Georgia Tech pulled this upset, you didn't you didn't quite think that, but now it seems more tangible. Texas A and M is the team on LSU schedule that came to mind when. You asked that question, like, who's the Georgia Tech? LSU doesn't necessarily have, like, a team quite like Georgia Tech that has actually been, like, turning things around and coming up like Tech has. I mean, their recruiting under Brent Key has been really impressive. Mm. Um, and they have started – they start, they showed signs of life last year that they and an identity that they didn't have before. They looked lost under Jeff Collins. Now it's like, okay, their team is going to, as, as Key said after the game, run the ball and uh, <laughs> try to, you know, be really physical up front. And now it's like, okay, you have to take Georgia Tech seriously. And there doesn't feel quite like a team like LS, for LSU like that on the schedule. South Carolina seems a little bit lost. They've lost a lot, like especially with Rattler, whereas <laughs> Tech brought back Haynes King at quarterback. It's not Arkansas. It's not it, – A&M's the one that came to mind because there's still quite a lot of talent on that team that mm. they just never got a lot out of. And you bring in a coach, uh, an Elko, who I think is going to want to be really physical – um, and if he can engineer like a quick first year turnaround, maybe kind of like Kelly did when he got here year one, all of a sudden, you know, you're going to Texas A&M in October, uh, having to play on the road against a team that might be better than, um, that you would think they would be coming off a season that they had last year going, I think it was what seven and five. So, uh, that's the team on the schedule to me that feels like a Georgia tech type game. Yeah. I mean, you can go back and listen to our season okay. preview podcast from last week. And I hope you do, if you haven't seen it, but, um, there, there's like six to seven SEC teams that I think have legitimate CFP hopes, like going into the season, you know, LSU, Missouri, Ole Miss, um, Alabama, Texas, Georgia, right? Tennessee, too, Tennessee. maybe. In, te in Tennessee, that's the seventh. And then there's these couple of teams, I would say a and one of them, and maybe Oklahoma is the other, where they're probably more fringe. Not that they can't make it, they're more, f but they're more fringy given their schedules and where they're at in their program. But they're going to keep somebody else from getting in. Guaranteed, one one of them will beat somebody else and keep them out. They, they'll be a kingmaker. Right? Yeah. yeah, and um, and I think LSU plays both of those teams. Uh, I know Missouri plays both of those teams. Like the, they play some of these. I think does Ole Miss play both of those? Ole Miss at least plays A and M. Like the, Texas plays them both. Yeah, I mean Texas. There you go. Texas plays them both. Like they're going to keep somebody out even if they don't get in themselves. So. It's just fascinating. Wouldn't Texas A&M love to keep a oh. Texas out of the playoff in year one? Of you know, the, oh man. we talked about this too on a podcast earlier this month, but if there's one game not LSU to pay money to get into in the SEC this year, I think it's that Thanksgiving weekend game in College Station. It's like $2,000 to get in the door, by the way, on StubHub for that. Uh, I don't know if I, I would pick a game to go to, I, I still feel like the game of the year in the SEC is you know, Georgia-Texas. It, it, it is as far as like overall quality, but like yeah. those teams probably... But, but for the theater of shape. it, oh, the theater is going to be yeah, fantastic. Oh, it'll be unbelievable. <laughs> so we, we have more college football this week, um, and we, we also, uh, you know, we know some of you like to maybe place a bet on some of it every now and then. So today's sports betting segment is proudly brought to you by the Queen of Baton Rouge. Experience the thrill of game day at 1717 Kitchen and Cocktails, your premier destination for elevated sports entertainment. We're going to welcome in Thomas Casale, our sports betting director, to give you his pick of the week for Saturday's games. Thanks, guys. Well, we have our four, first full slate of uh, uh, games this Saturday. College football, can't wait to get going. Uh, we'll preview the LSU-USC game in our next show, but for today, I'm going to give you my favorite bet for week one. It's another SEC team. I like Texas A&M at home against Notre Dame. You know, I think Notre Dame's a little overvalued heading into the year. Their strength last year was the offensive line. They lose three key offensive linemen. And then the player who was projected to replace first-round pick Joe Alt got hurt in early August and is out for the season. So I think they're really going to struggle against a Texas A&M defensive front that's one of the 10 best in the country. We've seen this line. Texas A&M was minus one. It's now creeped up to minus three at DraftKings. 
I like minus three still with the Aggies. I think Mike Elko comes into College Station and gets a statement win in his first game at Texas A&M. So lay the minus three with Texas A&M over Notre Dame. All right. Thank you, Thomas. Tiger fans, you can catch all the sports action at the Queen Casino's DraftKings Sportsbook Bar and 1717 Kitchen and Cocktails. With top-notch screens and live betting, it's the ultimate spot to watch your favorite teams and enjoy a cold brew or a signature cocktail. The Queen Casino is the only land-based casino in Baton Rouge and your go-to for game day or any day. Visit today and elevate your sports watching experience. A um, couple of typically overhyped teams there, I think, Texas A&M and Notre Dame. They always seem to like be in the top 20 and they're the team that falls out. Um, I actually like A&M's team this year. I like Mike Elko. Uh, it might be another year or two before they're really, truly contenders. We'll see. But I like that pick from Thomas. Uh, gonna, we're going to go into another segment here where we talk about Saturday's games. And I want to know what game is at the top of your list. And our list these weeks are brought to you by Associated Grocers. Join our team and support the success of local independent retail grocers. Apply today for available positions at Associated Grocers. Wilson, you first. What non-LSU game are you tuned into this week? I think I, I think I know what you're going to say, but go ahead. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I've, um, no, I'm, I'm going to throw you up. Te- uh, Texas A&M, Notre Dame. Oh, all right. No. Okay. Uh, actually, no, I am. Uh, um, I'll, I'll, I'll stick with that one, I guess. Uh, I, I am fascinated to see those two teams, to see if Notre Dame is actually in year three under Marcus Freeman. Are they ready to make a jump and be serious contenders? Is Riley Leonard their quarterback, someone who's actually going to make a difference for them um, the way he did uh, at Duke before he got injured? Can they, he get more out of their offense than Sam Hartman did when he transferred from Wake Forest? Um, because that's a team that looks like a playoff contender um, if that goes right. And I'm curious to see if they do or if Texas A&M is, uh, needs to be taken more seriously. Um, it's also, you know, the night game on Saturday, uh, and I think that that will be a, a pretty fun one to watch. So I think that's the one that um, I think for the sort of college football greater college football fan you might be most interested in yeah. um yeah th- sort of threw you off there didn't right, you, d- you did and so rav are you gonna go i didn't want to be with, i didn't want to just be pick. like the yeah. absolute like uh uh the thing you, th- you saw coming yeah, yeah. What, what's Keep at the top of your list rav well comes at george is easy to say i mean obviously that's the that's the other uh real marquee matchup on saturday and, and i love the, uh, by the way i love the i love the opening weekend or the oh, week one so Thur- games thursday friday saturday so sunday good. monday you know it's awesome and of course, this is the second straight year LSU, at least the second straight third year. Third straight they play year they've played, third on, straight Sunday. Year they play on Sunday. Okay, to open the, on those Labor Day weekend. Uh, Clemson, Georgia is very interesting. Obviously, is, is Clem, you know, Clemson, uh, are they going to come back, uh, try to come back into contention? I, I contend Georgia's schedule is very difficult. I it's know they have so a very hard. good team. I, I don't think they're getting through undefeated. They won't be undefeated. There's no way. Uh, but 11 and 1 would get them in the playoff, uh, obviously, and could win the SEC and could get them a bye. Uh, the other game I, I, I had on my list uh, of those three, uh, I've I picked three games was Miami and Florida. Miami is a team that a lot of people like as a as a uh, as a, their trendy pick to to win the ACC, win the yeah. ACC yeah. And, and get into the college football playoff. And again, if you win one of the Power Four conferences, you get a bye into the quarterfinals. You don't have to play that first round, so that, that's a big deal. And, and that's what it was still on the table for Florida State. Certainly, you know, there's a lot of the people are down on Florida State, but they they come back and win the ACC. They they're they're not only in the playoff, but they've got a bye. And and then Florida, of course, the whole situation with Billy Napier. Talk about pressure. We've talked about the pressure on Brian Kelly and Lincoln Riley. The pressure on on Sunbelt Billy is is pretty intense, and uh, he needs every win he can get. And uh, 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 this is a game where I think they're playing at home. It's in Gainesville. Mm-hmm. They they could win it. Uh, I have no faith in Mario Cristobal as a as a game coach. Not after the debacle of the Georgia Tech game last year. Kneel the ball. I mean, how hard is that just to take a knee? You know. And so Brent, um, Brent Key got in his head, man. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, that that's a fascinating game in terms of. Miami's a team that, you know, are, are they ever going to be Miami again that that I, that we grew up watching, you know, in the 80s and 90s? Uh, some of us grew up watching Wilson. Uh, <laughs> and then uh, are, are they going to uh, – and, and is Florida going to survive? Are they going to have yet another losing season? And will and if they lose this game, I'll, I'll, say, I'll, I'll make this prediction for you right now. If Miami beats Florida, B, uh, Billy Napier will not be coaching against LSU in November when LSU wow. go to get, goes to Gainesville. Wow. I, I like that prediction. I also think Florida's going to win. And, and I'm glad okay. you brought that up okay. because between Clemson, Georgia, and Miami, Florida, these are games to be looking out for when you have the college football playoff in mind. Because if the SEC can win a couple of big games against ACC teams, right, if Georgia and Florida both win, 
now when when you start divvying up at large spots between let's say 10 and two teams the sec is going to get the nod over a second mm. place acc team right? right i mean you there's only so many of these opportunities where the teams play head to head and if a team like florida that may finish you know, say they finish four and four in the SEC, they finish even three and five in the SEC. They have a tough schedule, but they have a win over the ACC's you know, third place team, or even maybe Miami wins the ACC. Like we all know the SEC is getting multiple teams in, but that could be the difference between getting three teams in or four teams in or even five teams in. Right. Maybe even a nine and three team in. We'll have to see. Yeah. Maybe so. It just depends on how things shake out. But those intra inter conference matchups really start to take a, a huge effect. And I think of a team like Florida that we all think is like mid pack in the SEC beats Miami. That's a huge feather in the cap for, for the SEC. And just because we obviously overlooked at Georgia Clemson, you know, I think a lot of people are just sort of assuming, oh, well, Georgia is going to roll over them. The line's pretty big. Like, Georgia's the number one team. We see the number one team in the country. Uh, Clemson's just been kind of trending down for a few years. That's why it doesn't feel quite as intriguing. Um, but this is a huge game for Clemson to show under Dabo Sweeney, Sweeney that it can uh, still be one of the top you know teams in the country. Even if they don't win, if they can push Georgia down to the wire, then it's like, oh, okay, you got, you're you going to have to keep an eye on Clemson too. Yeah, I think what, what we're seeing too real quick is that even early on, again, with Georgia Tech, Florida, Florida State, and some of these games we're talking about, with the 12-team playoff, the the, the, feel, the fear was, well, you're deleting what is the greatest regular season in college football. Well, the way we're talking about this, you know, LSU, USC, or some of these other games, every game still matters, and it matters a great deal. Minnesota, North Carolina on Thursday night. Those teams aren't in the top 25, but whoever wins that game is going to start, I guarantee you their fan base is going to start to think, okay, we can win this game and this game and this game. You know, we're, we're, we're in at-large contention going into November. And, like, that just wouldn't have been the case in past years. Even if you win that game, you're not going to make a four-team playoff. At, at least certainly not. You can't think about it until you get to 6-0, and 7-0 and or something like that. Right. But it, a, a game like that all of a sudden takes on in, increased importance. So, <laughs> bless you, Will. So that, so that's what's on our that. list. Uh, Tiger Fans Associated Grocers is hiring. Join a team committed to the success of independent retail grocers. Apply today at Associated Grocers and be part of something great. So that brings us to our predictions from Wilson and Scott. We're going to take a quick 30-second break and be back with those predictions right after this. Since 1988, Classic Industrial Services, Inc. has led the industry in specialty contracting. From thermal insulation to scaffolding, coatings, and beyond, we cover it all. Every minute matters in our commitment to quality and safety. We're here to serve with roofing, siding, heat trace, and refractory services. Visit ClassicIndustrial.com for more information. All right, it's time for predictions. Today's prediction segment is brought to you by Classic Industrial Services. Because at Classic Industrial Services, every minute matters. They're our newest sponsor. Our thanks to them. Uh, tell you more about them in just a minute. But first, guys, USC LSU getting getting going. It'll be 4:30 p.m. local time. It'll feel like an afternoon thing, but it's been a long time. We got a Saturday, a Sunday night with LSU football. Um, Wilson, you go first. What what you thinking for this one? I think that LSU wins. I think LSU wins 35 to 30 because neither of these defenses are going to be able to. I think just like shut down the the opposing offense. Uh, I like you know Miller Moss looked fantastic in the bowl game. So did Garrett Nussmeyer. You got those two quarterbacks taking over for the Heisman winners as first time starters. And while the offenses will probably be clunky a little bit at times, I still feel like this turns into a game that's fairly high scoring because you know we talk about you know so much how bad LSU's defense was last year. USC's was worse <laughs> somehow. <laughs> USC ranked. Uh, 121st in the nation in scoring. They allowed, and this is all their games, even the games against teams that like where they should have easily won, they allowed 34.4 points per game. LSU, by comparison, over the all in the season, allowed 28 points per game. Um, it ended up, you know, if you want to look just at Power 5 conference games, they allowed closer to, I think it was like 34, but USC still in its Power 5 conference games allowed even more points than LSU did. So there's a, a big turnaround that has to happen at USC, and I don't think either of those turnarounds are going to happen like 
overnight or over the offseason. And I feel like LSU uh, is going to be able to take advantage of that because of its offensive line in particular. I think this offensive line is going to show that it is uh, um, its talent, uh, show why it is considered one of the best in the country, a potential Joe Moore award winning line. LSU is going to be able to lean on that, uh, take advantage of a USC defense that is uh, – has not improved enough in the offseason and uh, be able to win what is still a high-scoring game because it's still going to have, I think, its own defensive issues. All right. Scott Rabelais, we have, uh, we've hyped this one up, the glitz and glamour of Las Vegas. As the backdrop, fight on against Fight Tiger. Who you got? Uh, I'm LSU winning as well, but uh, I went way under the over under, which is 64 and a half. 64 and a half is the over. Uh, LSU 31 24. I think both offenses are going to have times where just maybe on their own accord have, have you know, little struggles. You know, I think it's, you know, neither of these offenses were only went three and out very much last year, but I think we're going to see some of that in this game. And it might come down to for LSU if they end up losing, you know, a bad special team situation, a punting situation. The punting uh, has not been great for LSU. It has not looked great in the in preseason camp. No, it has not. No, it has not. Uh, they might end up using two punters, um, and they got a, a problem to deal with with Zachariah Branch, which I'm sure you all touch on a lot on Thursday. Uh, he's one of the, uh, yeah. the fastest players in uh, in the country. Might Brian Kelly go forward on fourth down more because of their punting situation? Hey, you just don't uh, punt. You situation. don't have a punter problem. <laughs> well, that's what they could do last year, yeah. except that they didn't even have a punter problem. Jay Bramble was solid, but we digress. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, but I, I think uh, LSU, as to Wilson's point, uh, tries to play ball control and and shorten the game uh, with their running game behind that offensive line against what is still, I'm sure, a fairly porous USC defense, and, and, and wins it uh, 31-24. Yeah. All right. So two LSU predictions here. Koki and Reed will give their predictions. Maybe I'll throw one in, too. On Thursday, we'll, we'll dive into this thing um, you know, from an X's and O's standpoint, a matchup standpoint, uh, in, in uh, Thursday's podcast. So join us then. Today's episode of LSU Insider was brought to you in part by Classic Industrial Services, proudly serving Louisiana and the entire United States. With high-quality scaffolding erection and rental services, metal siding and roofing, you can get anything from these guys. Check them out from large capital projects to commercial projects, smaller quick response needs. Classic Industrial is your go-to for quality and safety. They're not just about business. They're a proud community partner supporting local initiatives and helping build a stronger Baton Rouge because at Classic Industrial Services, every minute matters i mean they got a list of things they do here i don't even know what half of it is if you're in the construction business you probably do give them a call so uh our thanks to them our thanks to ways pro uh baton rouge clinic queen casino all of our uh sponsors we appreciate you all associated grocers he's wilson alexander scott rabelais amelia cotton was our producer today i'm zach ewing and thanks for watching the lsu sports insider